Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out top 20 funniest Monty Python sketches. Welcome to Watch Mojo UK, and today we're counting down our picks <laughs> for the most hilarious sketches and scenes from Monty Python's television series and films. Excellent. Now for something completely different. Y'all, I love Monty Python. I've seen every film. I think I've seen every episode of the show. When I was a kid, they used to play Monty Python on PBS. Here's to see what the top ones are. Number 20, upper class twit of the year, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Okay. All oh, right. There's nothing like a bit of sport, <laughs> and Monty Python have their own unique take on the sort of pageantry of upper class athletics. Five of the Pythons play an assortment of increasingly ridiculously named rich idiots who engage in the titular competition to determine who's the biggest old money dullard of the year. Each event consists of either something absurdly easy for someone of average intelligence, or plays into the kind of boorish behaviour seen among the privileged that the rest of us find irritating. And it's all brought together by John Cleese's announcer, whose enthusiastic running commentary is <laughs> truly a delight. The twits may be racing to early graves, but for the audience, it's a race for which event makes us laugh loudest. I do remember this one. I remember seeing it when I was a kid and I didn't quite get it because I couldn't understand what a twit was. I didn't understand the joke. But as I got older, I got it. Yeah, this is a good one. Number 19, Mr. Creosort, Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. One of my favorites. <laughs> the eponymous Mr. Creosort is a comically obese and odious man who dines yes. at a restaurant and proceeds to projectile vomit into a provided bucket and anything else nearby. <laughs> the unflappable French waiter takes his absurdly large order and sees to his spewing with the same professionalism. <sighs> After Mr. Creosort has finished his impossibly large meal, the waiter offers a wafer thin mint to oh. tap it all off and then runs for cover. <laughs> oh. The resulting explosion is literally <laughs> gut-busting for Creosote and often the audience. Love it or lose your lunch to it, no one is ever quite the same after watching the Mr. Creosote sketch. Yes. Oh my gosh, y'all. This is a seven-year-old boy's dream comedy sketch. I remember seeing this and thinking it was the most brilliant thing I had ever seen in my life. And it kind of, I mean, in a way it still is. I was at the right age to see this when I was a kid. Such a good, such a good movie. Number 18. What have the Romans ever done for us? Monty Python's <laughs> Life of Brian. Right. Judea is an ever contentious region, and its people don't take kindly to the Romans showing up. The People's Front of <laughs> Judea is one such resistance group, among many with right. similar names. As the group detail their plans to kidnap Pontius Pilate's wife, their leader, Reg, questions what the Romans have ever given them. What have the Romans ever done for us? The aqueduct. What? The aqueduct. <laughs> of everyone who complains about the government, Reg's rant and the resulting response are just perfect. Yeah, this is a great one. And kind of still applicable to today. There's a lot of things people complain about the government now that, well, the government's actually doing a lot of good stuff most of the time. Or its own citizens, I think. Right? Are we? I don't know. Number 17, Stoning, mm. Monty Python's Life of Brian. Right. The entirety <laughs> of Life of Brian parodies religion and mob mentality, but few scenes encapsulate both quite as well as this one. When an older man is charged, <laughs> apparently by his wife, of speaking the name of God, he's sentenced to be stoned to death. John Cleese <laughs> plays the childishly put-upon religious official, while the mob is full of women dressed as men, right. some of whom are played by men. The ensuing dogmatic <laughs> arguments <laughs> over what does and doesn't constitute blasphemy, and everyone's inability to talk about the accused crime without saying Jehovah themselves, is comedic gold. What was that saying about casting the first stone? Yes. Oh, this is great commentary about the meaningless rules of words. Brilliant commentary on religion and the superficial or shallow rules that we interpret from it. Brilliant. Yes. Number 16. Self-Defense. Monty Python's Flying Circus. Oh, the banana one? John Cleese plays plenty of unhinged lunatics, but this is arguably one of his most bizarre. Cleese plays an instructor in a self-defense class. His reluctant students are instructed in the esoteric art of defending oneself against attackers armed with fresh fruit. The students are eager to learn something useful. The teacher's forceful, crazed demeanor eventually <laughs> convinces one of them to come at him with a banana. 
<laughs> the ending varies depending on the version, but the result is the same. The teacher just kills them. As hysterical as this scene is, we have so many questions. Like, why do the students keep attending class? How has the teacher not lost his job? And hmm. which fruit traumatized him so? Monty Python does absurd really well. Because they commit to it. They do it with earnest, dramatic commitment. But John Cleese, oh my god. Such a great character actor. He could play any kind of ancillary character. He could be the straight man. He could be the crazy one. I mean, really, they could all do that. Now that I'm thinking of it. They're all pretty good. Number 15. Biggest <laughs> Dickus. <laughs> yes. Monty Python's Life of Brian. This famous scene Brian. says Michael Palin as Pontius Pilate. The lisping Roman governor has captured the titular Brian, who claims to have had a Roman father. Although the chief guard is dismissive of the name Brian provides for his dad, as it's clearly a joke name, like Biggest Dickus, the pilot <laughs> says nothing wrong. His best friend is named Biggest Dickus. What follows is a Herculean task for pilot's guards, as they struggle not to laugh at the juvenile moniker. According to Palin's <laughs> own diary, he kept improvising to ensure the extras were always on the verge of laughter. Of course, mm. the name of Biggest Dickus' wife pushes everyone over the edge. <laughs> I forgot about that. I forgot that Biggest Dickus' wife's name was... Incon... Incontent... Incontinentia buttocks. Number 14. Four Yorkshiremen. At last, the 1948 show. Yes, Python sticklers one. out there, technically this isn't an original Monty Python sketch. While it does predate Python, it was written by That's two Marty Freeman. members, and they performed it many times, so we're counting it. The sketch sees a group <laughs> of four wealthy men from Yorkshire enjoying a drink together as they reminisce about their childhoods in poverty. Their nostalgia quickly turns to competition, as each seems determined to outdo the other with how bad they had it in the old days. The descriptions of their abysmal living conditions range from appalling to downright impossible. The only thing more unbelievable than their claims is how funny this sketch is. I didn't really care for that sketch. It got a little too absurd too quick. Maybe I need to watch the whole thing to let them pull me along with the heightening. If you heighten too quick, you lose the audience, I think. I'm surprised to see Marty Freeman. I think he would have fit in well with the Monty Python crew. There's a theater here in L.A. called Largo at the Coronet, and they have a big mural of Marty Freeman outside. That is his name, right? Oh, no, it's not. Crap, what's that guy's name? Marty Feldman. 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 Number 13. Spam. <gasps> Monty Python. Y'all, when I was in high school, I had a shirt that said Spam because of this sketch. Because I love this sketch so much. It was just the Spam logo. T-shirt, wore it all the time. Spamity spam. Did they just float in? I don't remember that. They just descended into their seats. Spam. I don't Monty remember Python's that. Python's Flying Circus. Okay. It's, you know what it is? That show used to have all these crazy transitions. They would say, and now for something completely different. And then sometimes the characters would go into another sketch. or like It's, it's probably from a transition. Although it's a tinned meat of questionable origins, spam is also slang these days for inundating someone with a load of things they don't need. Right. And that definition owes its origins to this sketch. Oh. When a couple literally drops into a cafe, the waitress rattles off the menu items all of which contain spam, sometimes to an absurd degree. While the wife is disgusted and tries unsuccessfully to ask for hers without spam, the <laughs> husband is all for it. Oh, and their conversation oh. is often interrupted by the other patrons. All of I forgot. Everyone else in the cafe is a uh, Viking for some reason. Oh, and their conversation is often interrupted by the other patrons, all of whom appear to be Vikings, who <laughs> frequently break into a song about spam. Bizarre and language-defining, Spam is quintessential Python. Number 12, <laughs> Nudge Nudge, Monty All Python's right. Flying Circus. A nod's as good as a wink to a blind bat, and this sketch is considerably more obvious. Arthur Nudge is an excitable man who approaches an older gentleman at the bar. Using various confusing innuendos, he inquires after the man's wife. His frequent exclamations of wink wink, nudge nudge, leave the gentleman nonplussed at first. However, as Mr. Nudge dances more and more around the subject, 
The man eventually asks him what he's getting at. After much prevarication, Mr. Nudge fesses up in one of Python's best punchlines. Say no more. I do remember this. I, 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 I remember laughing at this when I was a kid, but now it gets a little old quick. I feel like that's a first viewing joke. You know, you can only heighten that so much, right? Number 11, French taunting. <gasps> yes! Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> King Arthur's quest for the Holy Grail is not without yeah. its obstacles. The first of these we'll be discussing is when his knights arrive at a castle. After hailing its occupants, they're surprised to discover that they're French. The outrageously accented guard that greets them then proceeds to troll them mercilessly claiming that they've already got a holy grail. His insults include breaking wind towards their general area and insinuating <laughs> their parents were rodents and all smell like berries, which is a surprisingly accurate medieval insult. With its incredibly quotable dialogue and combat involving farm animals as projectiles, this scene is one that has left its mark on pop culture, no doubt shaped like a large wooden rabbit. Yeah, that's a great movie overall. It's set in medieval times, but then there's all these little moments where they're in the 1970s. There's a there's a doctor or scientist who shows up. The police come in at the end and arrest them all. It's pretty pretty wackadoo, but very funny. John Cleese again, playing a wild guy. He's also down here, hanging out, playing this guy. Number 10, Dirty Hungarian Phrase Book. Monty Python's Flying I remember Circus. that. This was the 1970s, a time when everybody still smoked. As such, if you were heading abroad, you'd be in need of a robust phrase book that could help you buy cigarettes in a pinch. Hey. Unfortunately, the phrase book in this famous sketch is anything but. The Hungarian tourist, played by Clays, visits a tobacconist, played by Jones, and employs his best translations. What? Jones being British, he's relentlessly polite, even in the case of increasingly inappropriate phrases. But when he tries to say something in Hungarian, he gets punched <laughs> in the face. The phrase book's creator is later put on trial for intending to breach the peace. But sometimes in life, your hovercraft actually is full of eels. I don't remember seeing this one back in the day. But I love that they, they, they start here with this and then they explain that the writer of the book did it on purpose. Brilliant. Number nine, always look on the bright side of life, Monty Python's oh, Life of yeah. Brian. It's the end of the film, and Brian, still mistakenly identified as the Messiah, is being crucified following an abortive attempt to rescue him. Brian, played by Chapman, is serenaded by fellow criminal Eric Idle. Always look on the bright side of life isn't just hilarious because of the absurdity of it being performed during a crucifixion, but it's also an outstanding song in its own right. In a lot of ways, it's gone way beyond even the Pythons, and has been reissued as a single numerous times. Such as its renown, Idol appeared at the 2012 Olympics to perform it, after failing to be launched from a cannon. <sighs> yeah, I, re I saw an interview with Eric Idle, and he said that he wrote this song sort of at the last minute in the writing process of this. I also saw in a documentary about how there were a couple clicks in Monty Python. I think it was Graham Chapman and John Cleese. They were kind of a writing duo before Monty Python. Became, came together, and then um, Michael Palin and Terry Jones were another group. There was something about the styles where Michael Palin and Terry Jones would come up with those sketches or those moments where they had they would bicker about words, like like small little small talk misunderstandings or bickerings. Eric Idle did music, Terry Gilliam did animation, John Cleese and Graham Chapman <laughs> did, uh, what was, uh, I gotta look this up, y'all. Yeah, so Michael Palin and Terry Jones would do the little bickering things. Graham Chapman, John Cleese would come up with more narrative-driven sketches, and Eric Idle would do the music, Terry Gilliam animation. Cleese and Chapman worked as one pair isolated from the others, as did Jones and Palin, while Idle wrote alone. After a few days, they would join with Gilliam, critique their scripts, and exchange ideas. Their approach to writing was democratic. 
If the majority found an idea humorous, it was included in the show. The casting of roles for the sketches was a similarly unselfish process, since each, since each member viewed himself primarily as a writer rather than an actor eager for screen time. When the themes for sketches were chosen, Gilliam had, a, Gilliam had free range in bridging them with animations using a camera, scissors, and airbrush. In general, the work of Oxford-educated members Jones and Palin was more visual and more fanciful conceptually, while the Cambridge graduates' sketches tended to be more verbal and more aggressive. That was Cleese and Chapman. Cleese confirmed that most of the sketches with heavy abuse <laughs> were Graham's and his. Anything that started with a slow pan across countryside and impressive music was Mike and Terry's. Anything that got utterly involved with words and disappeared up any personal orifice <laughs> was Eric's. Okay. So their styles all complemented each other. I think that's really neat. The interview I saw, I think, was when they were writing The Life of Brian, where Cleese and Chapman would do the overall narrative of a scene, and whenever they need to break up the rhythm, Palin and Jones would have a little wordy-type bickering. Anyway, I'm digressing. There's a lot more. Number eight, Argument Clinic. Monty Python's Flying Circus. Michael Palin arrives at a strange clinic that charges people for a good, solid row. It's Clay's in an office, and he immediately starts to argue about whether Palin is even there for an argument or not, in a debate that quickly descends into the ontological nature of arguing. Palin runs out of time, <laughs> though, and then begins arguing with Clay's about whether he got the five minutes of arguing he paid for, whether he's paid at all, and whether Clay's is, in fact, arguing pro bono. The landmark <laughs> sketch has since become beloved by students of language and philosophy for its complexity. And we're sure we'll see plenty of argument clinics in the comments below. Yeah, see that little that little small talk bickering. I bet that's Michael Palin, Terry Jones. You know, that's their style. Number seven, Hell's Grannies, <laughs> Monty Python's Flying Circus. Idol's a television yes. reporter, letting the public know about the latest menace to British society, a gang of marauding old women. Wonderful. It's a parody of the Hell's Angels and features a man outfitted in biker gear saying that even he is scared to go outside with the grannies around. <laughs> they day drink in public, assault young men, trip people over, and destroy phone boxes. Ido says the grannies are rebelling <laughs> because they're so enraged about their children becoming accountants and they promptly trick him into falling through a manhole. It turns out that the Hell's Grannies are just one novelty street gang of many, all terrorizing 1970s London. Wow, yeah. This is one of the sketches where the whole idea is in the title, Hell's Grannies. Brilliant. Why didn't anybody think of this before? It's one of those ideas. It's so simple and perfect that someone should have thought of it before. Why am I counting my words? I do not know. Number six, the Spanish Inquisition, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Right. We're now in the year 1912, and a husband and wife are bickering over the trouble at Mill. A trio of Spanish inquisitors arrive, but they keep flubbing the speech Michael Palin is trying to make, forcing them to repeatedly leave and come back. <laughs> they get more and more expected each time, and it becomes a meta joke when they also keep reappearing in the same episode. Eventually, everybody is expecting the Spanish Inquisition to arrive and accuse them of various crimes against the Pope. They've also unfortunately left all their violent medieval torture devices behind in Spain, much to their upset. Wow, that's so weird. I remember the Spanish Inquisition episode where they kept coming in, but I forgot that they kept messing up their speech and having to re-enter. I totally forgot about that. What a great idea. Number five. The Lumberjack Song, oh, Monty Python's Flying Circus. One of my After favorites. After leaving a different sketch, Michael Palin ends up in the woods with right. Tony Booth on his arm and a troop of Canadian Mounties nearby. Part of what makes this great is that it randomly happens. It just feels like it keeps going and going and going and it's this random ending to something else. He launches into this now iconic song about the joys of a lumberjack's simple pastoral life. But our expectations are quickly subverted. The lumberjack reveals he likes to dress as a woman in his free time. And it's this he also associates with the hyper-masculine life of a lumberjack. Suffice to say, the chorus of Mounties and the woman he's with don't take kindly to this revelation. His confession <laughs> means he gets pelted with tomatoes and booed off. This was also released as a single. I don't think that sketch will go over well now. Shaming people for lifestyle choices is not cool now, but it's funny to 
juxtapose the manly loggers with unmanly things. It's funny. It's good. Brilliant. More juxtaposition. See? Just like the Hell's Grannies or the Spanish Inquisition who everyone expects, but they say you never expect them. Comedy gold. Juxtaposition. Do the opposite. You know? Yeah. Number four, the Ministry of Silly Walks, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Oh, wow, I forgot about, yeah. The genius of this sketch lies in its simplicity, as when you really get down to it, it really is just a group of people doing silly walks, but it's still got the characteristic Python complexity, because it takes inspiration from a long history of physical comedy. And much of those silly walks aren't easy to pull off. It's certainly a testament to Cleese's talents as a physical actor. He skips around, goose steps, flails wildly, and does all manner of bizarre movements. Nobody else in the sketch really bats an eyelid as Cleese arrives for his job at the titular government ministry, where he and his colleagues all develop surreal, silly walks for everyday use. <laughs> Another juxtaposition that works really well. Silly walks juxtaposed with uh, an official government program. That's funny. And yeah, the way he walks. I don't know if I can show this on YouTube, but look at that. John Cleese, y'all. Number three, the Black Knight. Flesh Monty wound. Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. The fearsome Black Knight's only job is to guard a plank of wood, and he'll be damned if he lets King Arthur get past him. Arthur initially wants to recruit him, but the knight takes his duty extremely seriously, and they engage in battle. <laughs> the famous scene results in Arthur lobbing off the knight's limbs one by one, which the knight repeatedly claims are minor injuries. The knight's love of taunting is matched only by the rude Frenchman who appears later on, both portrayed by Cleese. He and his many oh. flesh wounds have been referenced countless times in works influenced <laughs> by the Pythons. Yeah, that's... I think... I don't know what number one and number two are, but this is probably my personal favorite. I love when a character in a comedy has more confidence than they should, when they take themselves more seriously than they should. It's just... Oh, brilliant. Number two, the funniest joke in the world, Monty Python's Flying Circus. Oh, yeah. You could say that the Pythons came up with many of the funniest jokes in the world during their careers, but none of them were quite on the level of this one. The struggling writer, <laughs> Ernest Scribbler, suddenly comes up with a joke so funny, he immediately dies of laughter. His mother comes into the room to check on him and suffers the same terrible fate. <laughs> the joke is later retrieved for use by the British Army so that they can deploy it during war. They translate the joke into German to see if it still works and get into a joke arms race that results in a ban on joke warfare. Yeah, I remember this one. I forgot that they heightened it into using the joke as a war, <laughs> as a weapon. I forgot about that. Another juxtaposition. Another one. I'm noticing a pattern. Number one, the dead parrot. Monty oh, Python's okay. flying circus. All right. It couldn't be any other. Not only is the True. dead parrot possibly the greatest and most famous Python sketch of all time, but it's also one of the greatest sketches ever written, full stop. John Cleese arrives at a pet shop with a dead parrot, presenting it to shopkeeper Michael Palin, who insists that the parrot isn't dead so that he doesn't have to deal with Cleese's complaint. Palin insists that the parrot is just sleeping, despite Cleese absurdly proving the contrary. The parrot is stone cold dead, something Palin knew about when he sold the thing. But, of course, selling parrots is no job for a lumberjack. Is there a Monty Python sketch that has you laughing till you're pushing up the daisies? Drop 16 tons of your favorites. I feel like the first time I saw that one, I thought it was really funny, but it doesn't really hold up on repeat watches, I don't think. And I think that's probably a Michael Pale and Terry Jones sketch because it's that that bickering. I could see why it's number one though. I think I think um okay. Okay. Yeah, the Black Knight is still that's my personal favorite. I just love their movies so much. I can't choose a favorite. I like them all for wow, it's hard. Anyway, yeah. This was great. This reminded me of some of their stuff that I had kind of forgotten about. Thank you all for watching it with me. And I'll see y'all next time. Later.